7 a.m. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today. So Dr. Stewart is going to talk to us about managing a baloney venous disease today. So for the fellows, please take a picture of the QR code for attendance purposes. Sean, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Pappas. Uh, this morning, we're going to discuss the approach to managing below knee venous disease. Historically, below the knee venous disease has been avoided uh, for multiple reasons, based on false assumptions, limitations regarding treatment options, and the risk of complications was heightened. But nowadays, we have evidence-based medicine and treatment modalities to safely and effectively treat below knee venous insufficiency. Targets for treatment below the knee include diseased GSV, SSV, tributaries, varicosities, and perforator vessels. Now, you may cons or you may encounter uh, below the knee venous disease in various clinical scenarios. One, in patients early in their disease process. Two, in patients that had previous above the knee treatment, but their below the knee disease was left untreated. And three, in patients with recurrent disease. Now, patients early in their disease process may present initially with below-the-knee segmental GSV reflux. In a retrospective study published online in January of this year uh, from the University of Istanbul, almost 900 lower limbs of patients with venous insufficiency were studied, looking at reflux patterns of the greater saphenous vein. GSV reflux was classified into four types Types one and two on the left of the diagram represent approximately a quarter of limbs studied and was more closely related with younger, thinner, and early seep classifications. A second scenario often encountered are patients who have had above the knee reflux treated, but the below the knee disease was left untreated. Why was below the knee reflux ignored? Well, there's a high risk of saphenous nerve neuritis associated with below knee GSV thermal ability. Secondly, some doctors feel that below the knee disease will become clinically insignificant if above the knee disease is addressed. And lastly, it's estimated that one third of below the knee GSV segments are tortuous, thus not suitable for traditional treatment using thermal modalities. Now, leaving behind below the knee incompetent GSV segments after stripping or thermal ablation more times than not results in recurrent varicosities in symptomatic patients. In fact, treating above the knee disease only clinically suppresses below the knee reflux in less than half of limbs where there is a fully incompetent GSV. In a study out of Brazil from 2016, patients with fully incompetent GF GSVs were treated above the knee and the untreated below the knee GSV was examined at one month, six months, and one year post ablation. Although 70% of the below the knee reflux normalized at one month post ablation, by one year, reflux had returned in 70% of the limbs treated. So, moreover, significant reflux of greater than one second of GSV, a reflux in the GSV below the knee was shown to lead to development of symptomatic tributaries in almost 90% of patients. And studies show by treating this below knee disease, patients develop fewer residual varicosities, thus reducing the need for secondary treatments. And patients experience not only better relief of their symptoms, but symptom relief is achieved more quickly as well. Now, is it safe to treat below the knee venous disease? Well, these days we should all be well-versed at providing safe and effective treatment of below knee venous disease. In fact, using foam sclerotherapy injection into the distal GSV concomitantly with above the knee thermal GSV ablation has been proven safe and effective for over 10 years. In more recent years, below the knee GSV thermal ablation was proven to be safe as well. And with the new, non-thermal treatment modalities that have come into the market over the past five to eight years, there's really no good excuse not to thoroughly treat venous disease above and below the knee. So you can treat, uh, you can, I should say, you can safely treat below the knee GSV uh, disease with all modalities if you know what to watch out for. Um, we will begin by discussing thermal ablations, which are time-tested effective methods for closing below knee GSV segments. There's a few things I have practiced over the years 
when there were no non-thermal modalities available or when insurances only permit thermal ablation as a treatment option. One, I prefer to access the GSV no lower than at the level of the distal gastroc muscle to avoid any saphenous nerve injury. I also prefer only to apply heat to the proximal segment of the calf GSV and foam the distal and mid segments in the same sitting. For many patients, I actually just use a three centimeter RF catheter to heat the most proximal part of the GSV where the vessel is more dilated and where there's more or adequate soft tissue to minimize discomfort from tumescent administration and subsequent heat closure. Then I'll foam the distal and mid GSV at the same time. Now for segments of 10 centimeters or more in the lower leg, uh, a seven centimeter RF catheter can be used. For segments that are six to 10 centimeters, a three centimeter RF catheter can be used. And for segments less than six centimeters, a laser fiber uh, can be used using a five French introducer or a 16 gauge uh, needle to cannulate the vessel. Now with RF, I also sometimes only perform half cycles, meaning I'll apply heat for only 10 seconds as opposed to 20 seconds if the vessel is really small or if I'm concerned with thermal, uh, thermal burns or if I feel the patient is gonna feel some of the heat. Now, three things to consider with below the knee thermal ablation. First, saphenous nerve injury. The saphenous nerve is in close proximity to the GSV at two locations. At the knee, the saphenous nerve crosses the GSV and also in the distal two thirds of the lower leg. So I consider kind of the safe zone uh, for heating the GSV to be along the level of the, of the gastroc. So I, I rarely go above or below uh, the gastroc when I uh, apply heat to the GSV below the knee. Now, the second thing um, that I consider, um, or I should say, there's really, if you do injure the uh, saphenous nerve, you're gonna end up getting ner um, more paresthesias along the anterior shin or the, the lower leg. It really depends on the level of the, of the nerve injury. And there's no motor deficit with saphenous nerve injury and the sensory deficits may improve over time, but patients will forever complain about having nerve damage after treatment. The second concern with utilizing heat to close below the knee uh, GSV is thermal burns due to the GSV being more superficial below the knee. So I use tumescent fluid to push any superficial GSV away from the dermis. And lastly, some GSVs can run anterior close to the tibia bone. And uh, getting good adequate anesthesia can be challenging. So this can end up being a painful experience for the patient. For these reasons, below the knee GSV is often untreated. However, this is where our non-thermal modalities can be extremely useful, useful if allowable by insurance. In fact, these days, 20% of all ablations performed on Medicare patients are of the non-thermal, non-tumescent modality. I prefer these modalities to thermal closures if permitted by insurance for below the knee GSV treatment for multiple reasons. Um, I don't worry about nerve injury and they are great for patients that are needle phobic or have a low pain tolerance. Uh, for isolated below knee GSV, I prefer uh, Verathena uh, over ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Uh, Verathena is more effective at closing larger diameter veins. It has a better long-term closure rate and has less side effects due to the low nitrogen content. In one study after uh, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy of the GSV, five-year closure, closure rates were uh, only 26%. So treatment failure was also seen more commonly with foam sclerotherapy in obese patients or patients on anticoagulation. Now, the DVT risk is comparable between the two modalities, but many of these below-the-knee DVTs are really clinically insignificant. Many of the DVTs provoked by below-the-knee chemical ablation are in the mid to distal calf, uh, are segmental, very segmental and small, or are non-occlusive, so I just end up watching them. Now, here's a video of a below-the-knee GSV ablation using Barathena. Um, the patient's leg is elevated on the wedge and perforator vessels are marked 
Uh, the reflux in this case was mid-calf uh, to knee that was being treated. So we're gonna go ahead and anesthetize this, the skin and we're gonna use a five French introducer kit to cannulate the, the GSV. So here we're just uh, gaining access, as you can see on the ultrasound. And then we're gonna insert the guide wire and we're gonna follow it up the leg to make sure it doesn't detour into the deep system through a perforator. Now, I, I don't use a scalpel prior to inserting the introducer as it slides through the needle track pretty easily. So I, I typically draw up five cc's or less of varathena at any one time. Uh, a little goes a long way. And then when I inject, I slowly inject about half a cc at a time and follow the varathena as it fills the vein. Now in this case, I do not have to put pressure on the perforator since my area of treatment was proximal and my introducer was placed above the perforator as well. Now for both uh, varathena and ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, incidence of post-procedure DVT can be as high as 10% in some studies. I personally feel an acceptable rate to expect is about two to 4%. However, most of these clots are clinically insignificant and can be managed with serial sonograms. Clinically significant DVTs I feel should be around 1% or less. Now to help reduce the risk of DVTs, you can elevate the limb prior to injection. You can use a low volume of solution and know where your perforators are located and you can apply digital pressure and lastly, you can dorsiflex the ankle after the injection as well. Other things to look out for is thrombophlebitis has been reported in up to 15% of patients after treatment with varathena. I personally don't see this much. Uh, in the literature, recommended compression therapy after treatment is 48 hours of focal compression with the padding and uh, ACE wrap, followed by two weeks of stockings. Um, after varathena treatment of the GSV, I usually use the padding directly on the skin and then apply an ACE wrap above it. I usually do about 24 hours, not 48 hours of initial um, compression. And then I asked uh, patients to do stockings for at least one week. If they can tolerate stocking use for two weeks, that's even better. I have also with below the knee uh, varathena treatments of the GSV or tributaries. I haven't used the padding. I've just used gauze and an ACE wrap. Sometimes I'll, um, I'll use Coban. And if I do use Coban on top of the ACE wrap, I ask the patients to remove the Coban in about three to four hours, but keep the ACE wrap in place for 24 hours. And then I put them in stockings during the daytime only for about a, a week. Um, I tend to use more gauze when I'm injecting tribs um, and I don't really include the padding because the area of treatment is broader when I'm um, injecting the TRIBS um, and uniform compression I feel is, is most important here. Now with any chemical ablation, de delayed vein closure and its associated inflammation is going to occur. And depending on how long patients wear their stockings, the vein can close in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. I've even seen delayed closure from varathena eight weeks or more. So I try to promote stocking use as long as possible after chemical ablation. The compression helps the vein close in a timely fashion, and it also minimizes the inflammation when the vein closes. Obviously, less inflammation means less patient discomfort. I also um, definitely uh, tell these patients what to expect. I tell them to expect some swelling even into the foot and ankle uh, over the next two, four, six weeks after uh, varathena treatment or a lot of foam treatment in the lower leg. Now for physician compounded foam, patients can develop side effects, including 
migraine headaches, neurological migraines, chest pressure, coughing and wheezing. In rare cases, syncope, TIA, and strokes have been re uh, reported. For physician compounded foam, it's important not to use more than 10 cc's a day to help uh, avoid complications. And then lastly, please visualize your needle tip when injecting any form of foam. Arterial injections can cause ulcerations and potentially more uh, severe consequences. Now, MOCA is a modality that uh, CVR in the past has used. Uh, I think we as a group moved away from uh, MOCA after inferior closure rates, occasional patient dissatisfaction due to discomfort during the procedure, and a little higher risk of DVT than published. But I've always had good success with it, and it can absolutely be used as a modality uh, for closing below the knee GSV segment. Now, venous seal is quickly becoming my preferred method of venous closure. Um, it's one stick, no need for stockings post-procedure, long-term closure rates are excellent, and there's really less incidence of hypersensitivity reactions if resheathing is done. Now, if you do encounter hypersensitivity reactions uh, with uh, venous seal, uh, you can treat with NSAIDs, Benadryl, and even steroids. Um, venous seal is great. Uh, just know that it's not for everyone. Uh, there are insurance limitations. Uh, or just below the knee GSVs, patients with latex or multiple allergies, and then thin patients or superficial, uh, superficial GSVs are probably not uh, great to use venous seal in these cases. Um, but when appropriate, it's uh, my go-to uh, modality of choice. So basically everything we just discussed regarding treating below the knee GSV disease can be applied to treating the SSV. Uh, closure rates, mirror closure rates for GSV uh, treatment, um, thermal modalities carry the same risk of, of nerve injuries, obviously, when treating the SSV. Um, again, here's some closure rates uh, after SSV uh, treatment using various modalities. And then, you know, the nerve injury with thermal uh, ablation of the SSV is, is a real thing. Again, close to the knee and in the distal leg are susceptible areas for nerve injury. Uh, tibial nerve injuries can result in club foot. Sural nerve injuries can result in paresthesias near the ankle. Again, the safe zone for thermal ablation of the SSV is along the span of the gastroc. So treating the SSV, uh, Nerve injury, again, is a concern and can be seen up in up to 10% of patients after RF ablation, but RF remains the most common modality of treatment. Um, it's superior to ultrasound-guided foam due to poor long-term closure rates with physician-compounded foam. It's sometimes the only option due to insurance limitations, um, but uh, I, I still prefer Varathena, Venusil, and, and uh, even Mocha can be safe and effective uh, if permitted. Another quick video here. This is a video of an RF ablation of the SSV um, with a distal foam injection at the same time. Access site is above the distal aspect of the gastroc. Reflux here involved the whole SSV from the ankle to the pop. Gaining access. I'm going to insert the, the guide wire and follow that guide wire up the leg. Now, I usually keep the, uh, the needle in while I use the scalpel because I, I feel like the needle can help stabilize the scalpel here. So I just nick on top of it. Then the uh, dilator and introducer is inserted. And then the uh, RF catheter position is locked. And 
Let me make sure we're in good position here. So Tumescence is uh, hand injected. And then in this case, uh, two cycles of heat was applied to the SSV. And afterwards, uh, we're gonna do a distal foam injection using a 27 gauge butterfly and 0.5% polydocanol. And just follow that foam up. All right, so we, uh, we move away from axial vein treatment below the knee and discuss treating below knee tributaries and varicosities. Uh, many choices exist, but all have advantages and disadvantages. Below knee tributary disease can be treated using thermal modalities for sizable tributaries if permitted by insurance. However, the more common methods of treatment include chemical ablation and ambulatory phlebectomy. Uh, chemical ablation includes both ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy and varathena. Uh, with these chemical ablation modalities, we can treat multiple areas, branching vessels, and even superficial disease safely. Uh, we must consider, though, vessel size, long-term closure rates, and insurance limitations, obviously. Um, lastly, ambulatory phlebectomy is very effective, uh, usually permitted by all insurances, but can be associated with, uh, with pain, uh, result in scarring, lymphatic and nerve injuries. So um, we have to be careful. We'll um, quickly discuss one of these. Now lasers for tributary disease in Maryland, we have insurances that do not approve any form of sclerotherapy. And our only choice for tributary treatment is laser or phlebectomy. Um, also, you can use uh, laser closures for tributary disease if patients have allergies to STS or polyocanol. Um, I usually cannulate these tributaries with a 16 gauge needle and place the laser fiber through that 16 gauge needer, needle. Sorry, um, Laser closure of multiple segments of a disease tributary can provide definitive treatment. And with closure rates, they're equal to thermal ablations of axial veins. So it's, it's very effective. Obviously, uh, we're limited here by vein anatomy. Um, this is not my first choice in uh, treating tributary disease, uh, but you can uh, definitely make it work. Uh, more common, we are use, gonna be using uh, foam or phlebectomy uh, for tributary and varicose vein disease uh, treatment. When it comes to ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy, it's effective for medium-sized tributaries, three to five millimeters. Um, Good long-term closure rates usually require secondary injections, uh, but a few quick injections every year can be considered a success and as long as it keeps their legs feeling good. So another quick video here, the video of ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, perforators are marked, 0.5% uh, poly is mixed with CO2, injected using a 27 gauge butterfly, into here the posterior leg tributaries, which was causing nocturnal cramping and focal achiness in this patient. We're putting some digital pressure on those perforators so we can prevent foam into the deep system and allow the foam to navigate up the leg. And you can follow it with ultrasound. As soon as you see it going down into any deeper structures, uh, you can go ahead and stop injecting. So Varathena versus physician compounded foam. Uh, I prefer the versatility of Varathena. It, it has the same benefits to foam. It has the ability to close uh, larger tributaries and even varicosities with less risk of side effects. However, when treating larger vessels, even though it can be effective, you do run the risk of phlebitis. With chemical closures, patients are more dependent on stocking use also for a prolonged period of time to aid in closure and to minimize subsequent inflammation. 
And obviously with Veratina, there is a, a cost associated with it and a 30 day shelf life to consider, but it's my preferred method for treating tributary disease. I even use it for varicosities in place of phlebectomy if patients are needle phobic. So we're gonna show another uh, quick video. In this video, we're treating tributary disease with Veratina using a uh, 25 gauge butterfly. Uh, the patient's leg is, is elevated. Uh, the perforator vessels are marked and we're gonna inject two sites. First, a non-saphenous anterior trib and also a proximal medial calf tributary fed by a refluxing GSV. And in each case is about three cc's are used at each site. And again, we can follow the injection up the leg. And again, applying digital, digital pressure to the perforator vessel. Second injection here. And again, following it up the leg. And this is a 25 gauge, uh, so it's a little larger bore uh, butterfly to try to maintain the integrity of the, of the Verathena. Now, ambulatory phlebectomy. Um, I prefer performing my phlebectomies with an ablation at the same sitting. It's been shown to improve quality of life measures more quickly than staging treatment. It's also reduces the need for reintervention. In my experience, it also reduces the risk for developing phlebitis. Um, if you don't wait uh, to later address the, the varicosities after ablation. And patients are extremely satisfied not to see their varicosities, even if they're kind of beaten and bruised. So regarding phlebectomies, over the years, I've uh, treated patients with recurrent varicosities, or I've inherited patients with varicose veins that were never treated because the varicosities were located laterally or over bony prominences. Lateral leg varicosities are usually fed by either an anterior accessory vein from above, uh, a lateral perforator, or even a pelvic source. Um, the reason lateral phlebectomies have been avoided in the past and even now is due to the risk of perineal nerve injury. Since the perineal nerve runs laterally and superficial, just distal to the knee, um, I have performed these uh, phlebectomies safely, uh, but you do have to be cautious. Uh, perineal nerve injury can end up leading to foot drop. So this is my solution for avoiding pain with phlebectomies and addressing varicosities over bony structures. Um, I do mark the uh, varicosities when the patient is standing and I outline the vein. Um, I don't like to puncture the skin through the marker to avoid any tattooing. All patients are placed in some degree of Trendelenburg positioning. This drains the vein. It helps prevent bleeding. I then foam the varicosities, which further displaces blood and spasms the vein. As a result, the patient is less likely to bleed afterwards, and it reduces bruising. And then I anesthetize the skin. I add cold tumescent fluid, which further reduces bleeding and bruising. It helps prevent also discomfort during the procedure, and it elevates varicosities off of any bony structure. This allows for painless removal. Lastly, I use a 16 gauge needle to puncture the skin, avoiding any railroad scarring, and I hook the vein out successfully interrupting the varicosity. So I try to do this as quickly as possible and run, return the patient to ambulatory status. Uh, to reduce the risk for DVTs, especially if I'm doing this concomitantly with, uh, with an ablation. So we're gonna show a little quick video. So this video is uh, demonstrating a phlebectomy over bony areas. Uh, the varicosities here have already been foamed prior to administration of this, of the lidocaine. So we're doing lidocaine administration first. And then we're gonna to add to mess and fluid to float the vein in the fluid and elevate the vein off of any underlying bony structure. And 
And then we use a 16 gauge needle. Then I hook and pull or hook and cut the vein to interrupt it. And again, when we get down to the ankle, the elevating the vein off of the ankle bone or over a, a kneecap or the shin using the uh, tumescent fluid is, is key. And just kind of interrupting it here is sufficient to allow for good treatment. So when treating TRIBS and uh, varicose veins, I prefer chemical over thermal ablation. I prefer varathena over physician compounded foam. Um, I go out of my way to emphasize, uh, try to prolong their stocking use after procedure, uh, emphasize frequent uh, ambulation, so every hour I want them up walking around for a minute or two and uh, just lay down the expectation of delayed inflammation that can develop four to six weeks out. For larger visual varicosities, I prefer phlebectomy over varathena or foam. Overall, it's less risk for DVT, phlebitis, and skin uh, staining. Now, my treatment of choice for foot varicosities is phlebectomy over any chemical injection. Uh, dorsal foot varicosities can be common. Uh, they can uh, be painful with certain footwear and be unsightly. Uh, phlebectomy has proven to be a safe choice in treating foot varicosities. In a 2018 study published in the journal Phlebology, uh, phlebectomy was performed on 188 feet with varicosities. The two most common complications post-procedure were edema and transient paresthesias, which all but one case resolved within three months. Now, if you encounter what looks to be a varicosity on the lateral or the plantar surface of the foot, uh, think AVMs. I've seen uh, AVMs uh, located in these areas. Uh, medial foot varicosities can be a cause of tarsal tunnel syndrome where venous congestion causes dilation of the posterior tibial vein, which increases pressure on all structures running under the flexor uh, reticulum, um, or retinaculum, I'm sorry, uh, causing foot pain, numbness, and uh, weakened toe flexure, flexion. Uh, approximately 4% of tarsal tunnel syndrome causes are from varicose veins. Uh, patients present with on and off pain and numbness involving the plantar surface of the foot. Symptoms are precipitated by anything that exacerbates this varicose vein dilation, like taking a hot bath or shower or after exercise. Uh, patients encounter symptoms more frequently, also at the end of the day or at rest. So here, uh, an ankle MRI can confirm the diagnosis. And in order to achieve good treatment results, uh, you, need, you need to um, fix the vascular abnormalities, obviously, but also any foot deformities need to be corrected if present, and the tarsal tunnel decompression is also recommended. So um, combined treatment with a podiatrist is, is necessary. Now, lastly, below the knee perforator disease is a common cause of recurrent venous disease, focal pain, swelling, and ulcerations. Both thermal and chemical modalities are effective at addressing pathological perforators, which are defined as perforators with diameters of 3.5 millimeters or greater and uh, reflex times over 0.5 seconds. Uh, indication to treat these pathological perforators are, are listed here. So ulcerations, especially ulcers that are slow to heal or are not healing, think uh, you know, look for an underlying perforator vessel. Uh, focal pain and swelling, especially uh, around the ankle uh, or distal in the, in the leg, can be caused by uh, disease perforators. 
lateral varicose veins, uh, look for a, a perforator as a source. Um, and also be aware that arteries run beside perforator vessels in many cases. Now, uh, due to the pinpoint accuracy that is required to close a perforator vessel using an RFS stylet or laser fiber, closure rates are slightly lower with thermal modalities compared to chemical modalities. So don't be shy to Verathena or foam a mid or distal leg perforator. Just use low volumes of sclerosant, return the patient to ambulatory status as soon as possible. In my experience, resultant DVTs are typically small segmental clots that resolve without treatments and do not cause a P or post-thrombotic syndrome. So again, um, you, know, you can do this uh, safely. And even if there's uh, a, a small segmental clot as a result of verathena or foaming a perforator vessel, uh, a lot of times this will resolve and you can watch it with serial sonos. And uh, that concludes uh, this morning's talk. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Sean. That was very comprehensive. So I have a, a couple of uh, questions. So you had mentioned uh, thrombophlebitis with verathena. So uh, I just wanted to emphasize for the group that Sean very um, extensively uh, identified the way that you wrap it. He's correct because when you put the ACE wrap on first and then you put the noodle on and then put another ACE wrap and a coban, almost all of those patients are going to come back with foot swelling and pain. And uh, unfortunately, that was I had to learn it the hard way. I did it that way. So Sean's recommendation about putting the noodle on first and then lightly wrapping it with the ACE wrap will result in a decrease in the thrombophlebitic episodes. Also, Sean, you mentioned venous seal for the uh, small saphenous vein. Just keep in mind that you need at least 10 centimeters of the small saphenous vein in order to do venous seal. Otherwise, um, the, the sheath is too long and you can't do it. And I have a question for you, Sean. You showed a video of a uh, RF of an SSV, and then you did a second puncture with a, with a butterfly needle. Do you ever access with a micropuncture uh, sheath distally, to treat the top part, and then remove the sheath, and then just inject through the sheath to avoid yeah, the yeah. puncture? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, uh, you, can, you can do a few things. You can inject through the sheath. If you access distally, you can just apply heat to the more proximal part of the SSV, and then you can remove the catheter and through the sheath, you can uh, administer foam. You can also push foam through the catheter as well, um, through the cap of the, of the catheter. So I've done both. The, um, in, in, in thin patients, accessing, even accessing uh, below the gastroc can sometimes irritates, uh, you, you know, the, the sural nerve. So if you feel you can do it safely, that's definitely uh, one way of doing it. Um, I just, uh, I, I still get concerned with cannulating the SSV lower uh, in the leg. So does anybody else have a question for Sean? That was a very uh, extensive and thorough discussion about below knee disease and the complications with it. Any questions from the group? Fernando, I see you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sean, that was great, truly comprehensive, and your experience is vast. I have a question. How did you come to use 0.5% poly uh, foam uh, versus other concentrations? And uh, secondly, can you comment on our lack of uh, availability of poly now and switching to sotradecol? Uh, what I have found is that the patients are experiencing more pain with sotradecol. Um, what's your experience? Yeah, so I, I initially uh, went to, I just gravitated to using poly. Uh, I, not that I experienced more complications with STS in the literature. There seemed to be more complications with STS, um, especially if it extravasates out of the, the vessel. Um, and as you see, I do, a, I, in my phlebectomies, I inject the vessel with foam and then I do the phlebectomy. So there's obviously leakage of, of foam outside uh, of the vessel uh, when I do this. So when I was doing, the, you know, kind of experimenting with this technique, I just 
toned down my polydocanol from one, I was using 1% uh, to 0.5. And I, I was finding that 0.5 was adequate for treating most of these tributaries uh, or varicosities uh, that were, uh, I'd say five millimeters or less. Um, so that's kind of why I used poly. That's kind of why I use 0.5. Um, with any sclerosin, I try to use the lowest concentration that's effective as well as the, the, the least volume. Um, I, I do think that foam sclerotherapy is probably one of our riskier uh, treatments just because patients can have a lot of different side effects and also the DVT rate is higher uh, than with uh, thermal modalities or with, uh, with glue. And in terms of uh, availability with the STS, um, Dr. Nguyen could probably give you the history on that a little bit better. I know um, a little bit about it, but I, I don't know everything uh, that went on behind the scenes um, with that, unfortunately. Um, I will say that I've been using the STS and I've been, I've been doing the, the same technique with my phlebectomy and I haven't seen any ulcerations. Uh, I, I do also feel that, at least in my experience, they don't, I haven't seen a big difference in terms of pain with injection. Um, so I haven't, the only thing I've noticed differently is that it, it, it uh, the integrity of the STS seems to break down a little bit quicker than the polydocanol. So you just have to inject it a little bit more quickly. Um, it can't sit around or it'll, it'll liquefy. So Sean, we have multiple questions, Dr. Nguyen, Mo, and Dr. Edelman. So Dr. Edelman asked, with FLEBS, is it enough to break them up versus removing more vein? Yeah, so, so, so absolutely, uh, it's, it's fine just to break them up. Now, if you can get a good vein segment out, that's always great uh, because, you know, there's nothing going to be residual there for the patient when they run their fingers across their leg. You know, they're going to say, oh, I feel kind of this hard, tender knot or, or lump. And um, I just tell them, you're going to expect this. It's going to get, you know, reabsorbed over time, broken down. Um, so if they know it's not a blood clot to worry about, they're fine. But in my experience, just interrupting the vein is, is uh, adequate, especially when you start pulling a little bit and the tension's there. And, um, you know, you, you know it, it may, the patient may feel some discomfort. I'll just uh, use the scalpel uh, to, to, to cut the vein. Okay, Mo, go ahead. Good morning, guys. I have a question in regard to venous seal. Uh, how, how distal can I access for venous seal? I started doing venous seal, and the distal, the more distal I go, uh, the patient comes back with significant swelling, tight swelling around the ankle that looks like DVT swelling. Uh, we do the post-op scan, and there's nothing. Uh, so I, my concern was, it was anything going through the perf through any glues going through the perforators and causing something that, I, that I'm not seeing. Uh, does anyone experience the same thing? I have actually experienced that too. So as you answer that, just I've noticed that pattern also. Yeah. So for a few things that I'll, I'll say is that I I tend to try to access a little bit uh, higher. Um, there's nothing wrong with accessing low, and as long as the swelling is transient, if you tell the patient, "Hey, you're going to get swelling in the foot and ankle." Uh, and if they know what to expect and if it gets better, I don't see anything, you know, concerning about that. The uh, other thing is if you do get some glue into a perforator and, and you get a little distal clot, I, I wouldn't be concerned about this as well. When we have a, a clot in the leg, we worry really about three things. First, you're going to worry about the acute pain and swelling. Okay. Um, clots in the femoral uh, vein. You're, you're, you don't have a lot of collateral flow there. You're gonna get a lot of pain and swelling, but lower in the leg, you have, you have a collateral flow in the deep system. So uh, a, a blood clot lower in the, in the leg is not gonna cause as much pain and swelling as, yeah. as uh, that you experience up in the thigh. Also, these clots lower in the leg aren't gonna cause a, a, you know, a significant P. If they do break off, it's so small, it usually doesn't make it to the lung, or if it does make it to the lung, it's not gonna cause a clinically uh, significant D, uh, PE. And then lastly, we worry about post-thrombotic syndrome. And in my experience, the, I, I don't see any post-thrombotic syndrome with small segmental clots lower in the leg. So I'm a little less concerned about mid-calf and distal calf clots. Obviously you don't wanna 
out of your way to cause them and you should be careful uh, not to cause them, but uh, I, I wouldn't be as, as concerned. So Sean, is there any relationship between how tight you put the wrap on and whether or not they get foot and ankle swelling? I've yeah, absolutely. With, I've noticed it with the Verithene and the Venus seal, if you wrap it too tightly below the knee, they all come back with foot swelling and pain. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So there, there's, a, there's a, a few things. When a vein closes, you, you're, you know, your body doesn't know if a doctor closed your vein or you were injured. So all vein closures are associated with some form of inflammatory reaction. So you're going to get, you're going to get uh, some swelling with, with any modality of vein closure. Um, but definitely if you, if the wrap is too tight, then uh, patients are going to get some swelling in their foot and ankle. And I tell them flat out, I said, I tell them when you take the ACE wrap off tomorrow, you're going to have swelling in the foot and ankle. That'll get better over the next few days. I also tell them that if you, if they feel like their tightness in their foot or if there's uh, throbbing in their, in their lower leg, just loosen up the wrap. Uh, I think all of us have been mm. all uh, over the last few years and I, I, it's inevitable, at least when I'm on call, I get a, I get one of these calls where their patient is calling because they have foot swelling or foot pain. And I just tell them to loosen up the wrap and it, it uh, resolves the issue. If I may add, uh, a, sorry, Peter, but just, if, you're gonna, if you're that low, once we do low, what I do actually I wrap around the foot and I go around the ankle and I actually avoid even having a patient with any swelling to that because you're, you're, you're not creating that tourniquet effect. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you, Eddie. Ken, you have a question? Yeah, so I, I, I have a couple, um, a couple of comments, and then, um, and then also a question as well. So, Sean, uh, with regards to the SSV and Verathena, uh, obviously everybody knows that uh, Verathena is not approved by the FDA for the SSV, and and mainly because just the studies were not done there. Are are you doing SSVs with Verathena uh, at this point? Yeah, I I am doing it, and. Um... I think um, it's there's good there's some literature out there now that shows that it's effective. So for certain carriers, I, I am um, using Verathena for the SSV, and it it works really well. So so I have no doubt that it's effective. And again, I think the only reason why it's not approved is just because they just they elected not to uh, do the studies on it because they didn't want to see the complications of the distal uh, DVTs. But I, I would recommend to the group that uh, if you are doing that, that is not a recommendation from from CBR. We we do not um, we we don't feel that that treating the very, uh, SSV with Verathena is is appropriate at this point. O only because our lawyers have recommended against that. Okay, um, so uh, but but look, there are situations where there are no other choices, right? You have a previously treated vein that has lots of webbing, tortuosity. You have, uh, as long as you can document the reason why you're going off FDA label, I'm fine with that. I just do not want to do it as a routine basis, okay? Um, that's the first comment. And then the, um, the second part is uh, regarding poly polydocanol and STS. So as far as I have seen, guys, I've, I've looked at a lot of studies and if somebody can show me a good study, all right? There are studies out there that are biased. There are very small studies out there that say that um, polydocanol causes less pain than STS, but those studies also have significantly varying concentrations of STS versus polydocanol. I mean, there are studies out there that, uh, that have been shown to me where they're using 1% STS to shoot telangiectasias and spider veins. Okay, so when we're when we're using STS, of course you're going to wind up getting more matting. Of course you're going to get more pain, more discomfort, more necrosis if you're going to use one percent STS on a on a spider vein. You, uh, you know, in order to avoid those complications, you have to come down. Now, with that being said, I get it. I get it that the entire practice has been so used to using polydocanol that we have to come up with with a solution. So ultimately. Um, we, we are working on another vendor that is actually create, is working on getting polydocanol as a, not a, as a generic drug, but as a, as a, uh, as a trade drug, another company that's looking to produce it for us. And then uh, ultimately, look, uh, if there's a special situation where our physicians are going to say, look, I need to have this, I'm going to make it happen. Okay. Uh, but I do want 
us to be judicious. And just like anything, I, I will tell you that uh, the entire time that I've been at CBR over the last 12 years now, the only cases of skin necrosis that I've seen was actually with trade asclera and not even with compounded uh, polydocanol and not with STS. Okay. So we have about four of those and every single one of those has been trade asclera. Not one of them has been anything else. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's a good, that's a good point. And I will say in those cases, uh, most of them were over bony prominences like the, the shin or the ankle. So if you guys are injecting in those areas, just be very careful. Make sure you visualize the needle tip that it's in the vein. So Sean, Dr. Chapis asked, when you pre-foam with STS for your FLEB, what concentrations are you using? I'm using 0.5% or 0.25% uh, STS. Okay. And Marlon, you have a question? Marlon, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. In the Verisolve trial, which was the first introduction of, of uh, Verathena many, many years ago, uh, they were treating every vessel, okay, with Verathena. And that included the small saphenous. In the phase two trials, they also uh, were treating the small saphenous with Verathena. The reason it wasn't put forth in the Vanish trials is because of the, of the complications that were reported with that. So I, I think we have to be cautious. If we are treating uh, the small saphenous with Verathena, I think it would be important to start showing those results because if we, you know, hey, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Ken's um, uh, caution for this because the uh, anatomy of the small saphenous is different than other parts of the leg. And I just, I just, I think that the studies have been done and just not well reported. But if you had Nick on this call, he would verify what I just stated. Um, the, well, that's, that's all. I just wanted to make sure that, that we understood that that had actually occurred before and that's why they didn't put that forth. Thank you, Marlon. Sure. Okay, so it's 7.15, and I don't see any other questions. Sean, that was uh, excellent, very well done. Uh, uh, we recorded this talk and uh, when we get the edited version back, Stephanie will send it out with the link as well with the um, survey so you can get CME credits for this. So thank you, everyone. Everyone have a great weekend. Great talk, Sean. Thank Ciao. you.